Hi, my name's Andy Bombeck, and I'm the author of Doctor and Long Days, Short Years. So I always start with a lightning round of five questions at the beginning. So when did you first identify as a writer? Uh, probably after college, I spent a year in Greece and I was living with three other people who were all undergraduate English and like creative writing majors. And I wasn't, but they, they were like huge readers. And they also said like every week we're going to do like a writing group and we'll share what we've been working on. And they said, do you want to join us? And so that's sort of how I got involved. And what's interesting is that three of us still, three of the four are still write. So like we all still have that bug. I mean, being a doctor is like a serious, you know, commitment. So you, you've just been kind of torn this whole time. Well, so when I went to Greece, I actually had already been accepted into medical school and I took a year off to go to Greece and just teach English and make sure medical school was what I wanted. So if I'm going to be like completely like transparent, I think at some point I had written something like 15 short stories by like midway through the year. I look back on them. They're all like just complete ripoffs of whoever I was reading. But I remember sending it to my older brother, who's a screenwriter. And I said, what do you think? You think this could be a collection? And he was like, you have maybe five good sentences and all of this. Like oh! stick to your, stick to your original plan. Was, yeah, was, I think he, I think he like to be serious. I think he was like, I think only one of these stories really feels original and everything else feels like you're just regurgitating what you're, what you've been reading. But to some degree, I think that's probably how a lot of people start out, right? They yeah. just copy what they're reading. So that was like, I had never done that in a formal way. So that was like my version of doing it. That's hilarious. So your brother was just like, no, there's only room for one artist in this family. <laughs> exactly. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> What's your all-time favorite book? Um, my all-time favorite novel is The Moviegoer by Walker Percy. I, I read it first in, as a freshman in college. I read it again right before I graduated from college. I read it in Greece, like the the president of the school that I was working at, she was a Walker Percy scholar. And so she had like, like a vintage version of the book. I read it again as when I was in med school. When med when I was in med school, I wrote a novel that I actually got an agent to represent. And it was actually just an updated version of the moviegoer. It was <laughs> like, I basically just completely paralleled the moviegoer, except I, I said it in like current times and I changed the character from a man to a woman, but otherwise it was like, and anybody who had read the movie goer could tell it was sort of like an updated version of the movie goer. What's this about? And like, what did you love about it? It's actually a pretty mod. I mean, it was written in the sixties, but it's pretty modern and that not much happens. So it, it all takes place over a very short period of time. I think it's like during Mardi Gras weekend. And the whole book is basically this character who's clearly depressed, trying to talk himself out of depression and, and sort of act himself out of depression. And it's sort of his reckoning with how he deals with depression. So I just, it was such like an internal novel that I had never really read something like that before. Mm -hmm. And there's just these beautiful discussions that he'll just go into that are completely not plot related. And I think it was like one of the first books I read where like, I was just like, oh, you could you can write without plot and it can be extremely interesting. So that's that's sort of what I tried to do when I when I wrote fiction, but I think it's hard to do it well, which is why I never succeeded as a fiction writer. <laughs> what is your dream writing routine? Like an absolute dream? Like if yeah, I Yeah, like could, are you still uh, a doctor in your dream writing? No, routine? <laughs> no way. I mean, like in my dream, like I I I literally do dream about this. I'm like, oh when I retire and all my kids are out of the house and I have literally like no responsibilities. Like I will wake up, I will exercise, I will make breakfast solely for myself, and then I will start writing, then I'll read a little bit, eat lunch, take a nap, write a little bit, read a little bit. But it was it, just this idea that like nothing is claiming your time or attention mm -hmm. other than what you're reading and what you're writing. Do you, do you know um, Donald Hall? He's, he was like a poet. He was married to Jane mm -hmm. Kenyon. They were, they were these two poets who were married to each other. And then when he was in his like 80s and 90s, he wrote a lot of essays about just like the end of his life after she died. But he would describe their day. And I remember like reading it and I was like, this is like the perfect day. Like he, and he would like, we'd wake up, we'd eat breakfast together, 
Then we'd each go off to our separate places to write. We'd come back at lunch, maybe talk about what we wrote about. Then we'd, you know, <laughs> it was, it's funny because then he was like, then we'd go upstairs, make love, take a nap. <laughs> then, we'd then we'd walk around for a little bit. Then we'd each go back to our places and write for like four hours, meet for dinner, have a drink, watch the Red Sox and fall asleep. <laughs> like, like that's a pretty nice routine. And like, you know, both yeah. of them were, were incredibly accomplished writers. I love that. So what's your real writing routine these days? My real writing routine is I walk to the train and it's about a 10 minute walk. And I sort of think about what I'm going to write when I'm on the train. And then when I'm on the train, I take out my laptop and I have about 22 minutes without any distraction because I don't get internet or anything on the train. And I write for that full 22 minutes. Like I, I, I know the stops. I hear them being mm -hmm. called out and I, and I, I get it all done, whatever I'm going to write. Then I close it up. And then I generally don't do anything with what I wrote until the next day, but I will think about what I wrote in that 22 minutes over and over and over again throughout the day. Like I'll think about it on the subway, even though I don't, you, I don't like to take out my laptop on the subway. So just for those who don't live in New York, like, so I take a commuter train from my suburban town into New York city. And then I switch to a subway to get to my work. So on the commuter train, it's like much more spacious. It's a little bit more like fancy. So like you can take out your laptop. Everybody's working on laptops. It's not a big deal. The subway, it's like very squished together. It's you like you sometimes don't stolen. even have, yeah, <laughs> you sometimes don't even have the room to just hold your book. And you'd want to get out of there as soon as possible. Like you don't want to relish the time. Sometimes what I'll do is like I will take a, a local train rather than an express train to get more time writing. Uh -huh. I, I think writing on the train is like the best thing. That's so funny because when you were just saying that, it reminded me of my fiance and I have this thing where <laughs> it's a stupid inside joke, but we'll say sleep now to each other because it's like so hard to sleep on command. So it's yeah. just like, <laughs> you know, when it's like time to go to bed, but we're still wired, we'll be like sleep now. And that's what it sounds like. It's like right now you have 20 minutes. Yeah. How do you get your... Is it just because you've been doing it for so long and it's like the routine of it that you've trained yourself to write in this like highly chaotic state? Probably, but I think that walk to the train is really helpful because I have mm -hmm. that like 10 to 12 minute walk where I'm just sort of saying like, here's how you're going to say it. Like, here's how you're going to jump into it. So I, I, I might spend that entire 10 minute walk just sort of going over that first sentence. And then once you, you know, as you know, like once you get into that first sentence and it's right. out of the way, it sort of leads pretty easily into the second sentence. It's funny because we were just talking about one of my friends from Greece who's still a writer. She wrote this essay for Catapult about her writing routine. And she uses this technique called the Pomodoro technique, mm -hmm. which is basically 25 minutes of writing and then five minutes of a break. And I was reading it and I was saying sort of exactly, I'm not exactly 25 minutes, but my commute is 22 minutes. And it's pretty mm -hmm. clockwork because they have to stay on schedule. So like, I'm almost doing what she would call one Pomodoro. Like she says, like I do, I try to do three or four Pomodoros mm -hmm. in the days that I'm writing. But it's interesting that it just works out that my commute is very close to that magic 25 minutes that this technique of Pomodoro technique has, has suggested for doing any sort of artistic work. Yeah. Do you get any like time at night and you read a lot too. So how does mm -hmm. that work in your schedule? Yeah. My nights are like my, my typical night is I get home, I make dinner, I feed my family. I put my boys to sleep. My wife puts my daughter to sleep. And then I make lunches for the next day. And then I take a book out and I read and then usually within like 30 to 45 minutes, I fall asleep while reading. I'm so tired. Like the idea of doing anything that is important. I mean, reading is obviously important, but like actually like trying to get work done on a book would be, would be impossible. Mm -hmm. So, so no, every once in a while I will steal some time at work, like on a lunch hour to do a little bit of like revising or editing. If I have like a deadline approaching, but mm -hmm. for the most part, I really only write in that 22 minute block in the morning. That's incredible. And it's so helpful. I mean, I have to say like this most recent book that I published, I sort of signed the contract in February of 2020 and I had a deadline of December, 2020. And I was like, oh, this is gonna be so easy. And then COVID hit in March 
And then what happened in COVID was that basically the hospital said to us, we really don't want you taking public transit. So we will basically give you free parking at the hospital if you don't take public transit because they were just afraid of all of us getting COVID on public transit. Right. That was for like people who were commuting like me. And then people who were within New York City, they actually provided free buses, like hospital sponsored buses. They were just so nervous about people getting COVID in public transit. So for like March, April, May, and June of that year, I lost my commute. Yeah. And I remember at some point I was just like, how the hell? Sorry, are we allowed to curse on this? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I could just be like, how in the world am I going to write this book if I don't have my train? Yeah. And then I also realized that I told my um, my boss this because I used to travel a lot for work. So in addition to taking trains to work every day, I used to fly at least once or twice a month to give a lecture or to go to a conference. And I was doing so much writing in airport, like waiting rooms and and on planes and in hotel rooms when I didn't have any distraction. And I, and I realized I was like, I've lost all this protected productivity time. And finally, around like July of 2020, I just told my wife, I was like, I'm just going to take this. I'm going to take the train again because yeah. I, need to, I need to go back to like, I'm going to miss this deadline. I actually did miss the deadline, which I, I didn't know at the time. This might be helpful for your listeners. Apparently, like these deadlines are not as hard as yeah. people say. Because I remember like the day before the deadline, I sent this like really like sad, sap email to my agent and I was like what do you think I should do it's due tomorrow and I have like I, I think I said like I think I have like half of it done but in truth I really only had like a third of it done and he was like this happens all the time especially with COVID like things you yeah. know people are going to give you a break don't worry about it so but it, 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 I felt bad like I was I, I, I like the idea of missing a deadline felt so so like oh my god please I I I hear writers do it all the time yeah yeah (laughs) what's one piece of writing that makes you jealous you didn't write it Ooh, I I would say the kind of writing that I try to do which is sort of this hybrid of cultural criticism some scientific writing but blended in with memoir like the apotheosis of that is Eulabis's On Immunity Mm -hmm. Um, I think it's like the best book about science it's one of the best book about medicine she's not a doctor but she's a child of a doctor but it's just the most it's a perfect book like i i when i read it i was just like i need to try to write like this and i was just like in awe of uh of what she's able to do i I love all her writing like I, i love her first book of essays i like i liked her most recent book but that book in particular if you say like what's the kind of book that you want to write and what's the kind of book that you wish you could write that's the book Nice. Okay. So how much is writing a part of your life as a doctor slash academic? Like, are you doing this a lot in your day job? Well, I write all the time. I mean, as a doctor, you write all the time because you're writing notes about your patients. Mm -hmm. You're writing communications to other doctors. I take a lot of pride in my notes being like extremely easy to follow and like tell a good story. Like I actually like go back and edit my notes, which nobody does. And the poor medical students who get assigned to learn from me, like I'm like the first day they they meet me, I'm like, just so you guys know, I, I I'm a writer, and <laughs> I I expect your notes to be like really well written. I, I do like, I mean they they probably like, why are you critiquing my grammar and sentence structure rather than like my medical knowledge? But like I really do tell them, I'm like nobody wants to read this note. This note is completely like unreadable, and and I and I always tell them like less is more, like because they try to write these like eight page notes, and I'm like stop at four pages. So I do a lot of writing just in that. And then because I'm an a- I'm an academic physician, I write a lot of articles. So mm-hmm. and I write like I, I wrote like a, t- a medical textbook and I you write a lot of chapters for other textbooks. So I do a I do a, a fair amount of sort of true medical writing for like scientific journals and and things like that. So there's there is a lot of writing that's involved in my work. And it, to some degree, it is a little bit translatable because what I try to do when I write for medical audiences is try to make it really well written. So mm-hmm. to try to, so like when somebody, cause I do a lot of, you know, there, there's a thing in academia called peer reviewing, which doesn't really make it too much into like literary writing where you, you like, if I write an article, it gets sent out to three or four of my, my colleagues to basically review it and say what's missing and what, what can be improved upon. It would actually be the perfect model for literary magazines because 
you peer reviewing, you have to get it back your comments within two weeks. So imagine if you submit a short story and you can get comments from three different readers within two weeks, it would oh, be like yeah. amazing. Right. But um, versus a the, form rejection. Yeah, exactly. It. So whenever I read an article, if it's poorly written, if there's typos, if there's grammar, if the sentences are like just messed up, I almost always reject the paper. Even if the scientific stuff is pretty solid, I'll just say like, this needs a rewrite before we can review it. So I work really hard to make my scientific writing like really good. And, you know, people often will come to me and say, oh, I really loved your article on this. Or I really loved your article on that. And that's something that I take pride on. And I think at some point when I decided to write essays for non-medical audiences, I had done a lot of practice with, you know, what I would call like polished writing. So it wasn't mm -hmm. so alien to me. So then when did you start publishing your standalone essays and stuff like that out in the world? Yeah. So it's interesting. So I, I, I mentioned that I, 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 my first like life as a writer was trying to be a fiction writer. So uh -huh. in medical school, I wrote, you know, short stories and sent them out to lit journals. And this was back in the day where you used to, you used to put them in like an envelope with a self-addressed step envelope is that long ago. And I got <laughs> a few published at some, some places that were at the time were good. I think a lot of them don't even exist anymore, but I was getting a few bites and then I wrote this novel in medical school and I got a, a fairly, you know, good agent to represent it. She wasn't able to sell it, but, you know, they, it got a lot of favorable comments from editors at a lot of places. And I've kept in touch with her and she always, she still talks about it. She's like, I always can't believe we didn't sell it, you know, mm -hmm. but so I, and I kept working at writing fiction, but at some point I just realized like, this is around maybe like 2008, 2009. I was like, I just don't, I don't think I have the chops for this. Like I, when I read a really great novel, I never get the feeling like, oh, I could do something like this. Right? Mm -hmm. Like like when I read On Immunity, I, I knew I couldn't be as good as Eula Biss, but I was like, I could do something like this. Mm -hmm. I never get that feeling when I read like an amazing novel, like, oh, I could I could do something like this. So I, I just stopped writing. And then for about four or five years, I did no writing. And then I got into some of these you know, creative nonfiction writers, memoirists who were really experimenting with form. And I really liked what they were doing. And I said, you know, I, I would like to try to do this again and write about myself. And so then I started to sort of write these small personal essays and find places on the internet that would publish them. And that was really sort of the beginnings of writing nonfiction for me. And then I was lucky enough to have two places that sort of gave me the equivalent of a column. So um, nice. I emailed Aaron Birch at Hobart and I said, you know, I, you have this on your website, you know, pitch us if you want to write a column, I'm going to start reading the, the Carl Oven Knausgaard books, my struggle. I would love to write a column about what it's like to read these books. And he's like, sure. You know, so I wrote like 10 essays about my struggle as I was reading them. And then I formed like a sort of like a writer mentor type friendship with the writer, Amy Fusselman. And she said, you know, I have this website called Ohio Edit. And if you ever want to write for us, let me know. I had sent her like a fan letter about how much I loved her books. She, I think she said like only writers like my books or something like that. She's like, if you're a writer, you know, I run this website. If you ever want to send me stuff. And I sent her something that she published. I sent her like what I thought was my best thing and she published it. And then she said, if you ever want to write more, let me know. And I said, oh, well, you know, what about a book review column? And so she said, sure. And so I just would write book reviews for that website. But the book reviews were like personal essays disguised as book reviews. Mm -hmm. So I was getting a lot of practice just writing about myself and writing about my thoughts. And when I was in med school, I took two fiction classes as part of the, their, their night school program. But those are the only formal writing classes I've ever taken. So this was sort of like my version of learning how to do it was just sort of getting as much practice as possible by writing these 1500 word personal essays in the form of book reviews. Cool. So tell us, I, doctor was first, right? Mm -hmm. Give us like the origin story for that, because it started out as something that you'd conceived of as slightly Very different, different. Yeah. right? So, right. so explain that. So around, I think around 2014, I started thinking about writing a book about being a doctor. And the idea was I was, I said, I'm going to write sort of like a no holds barred behind the scenes look at what it's like to be a doctor. Like basically I want, I'm going to share all the things that our profession's a little bit embarrassed about admitting. And I started just doing it as paragraphs because I was, I was really into this lyric essay style 
it worked really well with my writing style where I, if you only write 22 minutes a day, writing like one great paragraph is a huge success. So mm -hmm. I just started writing what I thought was like one great paragraph a day. And I eventually had this like 60, 70 page document of all these paragraphs. And then I just started to assemble them into chapters based on subject matter. And the idea was like, I'll have this book length lyric essay about, about being a doctor. And so at the time, the sort of the mecca of this kind of essay was Grey Wolf. And they run this nonfiction prize contest. Now, I'm so naive to this thing. Like, I don't realize like, this is like saying like, I'm going to, I'm going to start running I'm track audition and I'm gonna... for the olympics or yeah something. right i'm, I'm <laughs> gonna start running track and i'm gonna try to make the olympics this year you know it's like it's it's so i, I but i i didn't know the landscape so like i didn't realize like this is like a one in ten thousand chance of winning right so i actually contacted the fiction agent that i had worked with in med school because her client had just won the previous great wolf award so i was like oh like i see your client won the previous award what do you think and so i sent her the, the book and she was like this is such a weird book she's like it's so insider baseball I can't imagine anybody would really be able to place it you know she's like when you try to sell a book the first question people ask is like where would you find it in a bookstore and I have no idea where you'd find it in a bookstore and I was like well, I, I would try to look for it in the in the essays part of the bookstore which is like the smallest section of the bookstore it's like literally yeah. like half a shelf it's like poetry and essays get like one little thing but she was like, yeah, but if you're going to sell a book, the, the booksellers want your book to be in the medicine section. Right. So she's like, this is why it's not going to work. But she was like, oh, you know, I, I'm happy to like, you can put my name on the submission and see what happens. But obviously nothing happened. And then so afterwards, I was like, what do you think I should do? And she was like, honestly, this is like a small press book. If, if you can find a small press to do it, I don't think you need an agent. If you want to find a different agent that might be interested in it, like maybe they'll give you some advice. And I, she was just really helpful and very honest. So then I did like what they always tell you to do, which is like, if you want to find an agent, just submit to your favorite author's agent and just see what happens. So I sent a query letter to like an agent who represents like two or three of my favorite authors. And I basically was just like, I'm, I, you know, I love your authors. Like they're the kind of book that I want to write in the, in the cover letter. I quoted his authors and I was just like, I've written this book about medicine and can you read it? And he read it and he said, I love your content. I think it's like, this is the kind of book everybody would be interested in. It's so clear to me who you're reading and whose books you love and and how how much you love their style. But no one's going to read you for style. He said, you know, if anybody's going to read you, they're going to read you for content and for your ideas. And nobody is going to be like, oh, I can't wait to see what style he uses this time. He's like, you know, so let them be the stylists and you just focus on content. And I think you could get this material across a lot better if you just wrote it in a traditional form. Don't try to do this lyric essay, you know, white space thing. It's not what your material really is best suited for. And it was, it was helpful advice. So then I reworked it and I made it a more conventional book and I sent it to back to him. And he said, I still think it's not quite, ready to send places. I'm not sure it ever will because it's such a hard book to sell because in some ways it's sort of dark. Like I'm not sure anybody would want to read a book about what their doctors think about them. <laughs> right? He's like, I'm not sure people really do need this sort of degree of, of transparency. I mean, I forget exactly. How I said would it, argue just... that that's what's good about it, but <laughs> yes, I think he was just like, it's just, you know, it's right. I weird. mean, like he basically degree, was like, also saying it's too it's weird. It's still too right? weird. Right. And so he said, he said, I'm open to ideas, as he said. So I said, well, there's this series of books called Object Lessons. I had worked with them before because they also ran an essay series for The Atlantic. And I said, one of the chapters in the book is, is what that Atlantic essay was. And I love working with that editor. And I know they have a book series. Can I send it to them? And he was like, oh, definitely. This is such a great idea because... When you have a weird book, it's actually easier to get a weird book into a series mm -hmm. because, you know, like places like Grey Wolf or Coffee House or Saraband, like all these smaller presses, they put out maybe 10, 15 books a year. Like every one of their books has to be a superstar. Like they they have to be confident that every book is 
basically perfection, right? Like mm-hmm. they can't take a, they're not going to take a crazy book like yours, but in the series where you're one of 50 books and each year they're putting out like 12 books. And when the day your book comes out, there's three other in the series coming out. They can have like a curveball here and there. Like they can like have a weird one there. And he's like, I think it's a great thing to try for. And then lo and behold that I, it works. So I mean, I, I submitted to them without like him doing any of the sort of submission for me but he helped me with all the contracts and things like that. And, and I've stayed with him, you know, ever since. Cause I, I think the best thing that he did was he was just like, so brutally honest with me. Like he didn't uh-huh. blow smoke. He was just like, this is not ready. This is not you. This, you know, so he helped me figure out my style. He helped me figure out what kind of, you know, market is out there for me. And uh, I, I, I really respect that. I think it's, it's great. It sounds like from our class visit that you worked with Chloe a little bit on this mm-hmm. and Maybe was Amy Fusselman too? Did you work? Yeah, with her I on worked. This? So I, I worked with Chloe on the first round. So this is Chloe Caldwell, and I I found out from her blog that she did like freelance editing, and so I asked her like, could you help me? Basically, I asked her to help me prepare the book for the Grey Wolf submission, <laughs> and she and they, and she and so funny because she was just like saying the whole time, she's like, I think you're gonna win. I think you're gonna win. And I was like, I, I was like, this. I was like, there's no she's way. She's the we're. best. <laughs> yeah, I think she's a very she's a very supportive teacher, but she really did help me. And what I like about her her editing style is like I don't know if I'm, I I know you work with her as your teacher, but if she's ever ed- edited like a long form thing for you, she does like two ways of editing. Like she does like these line by line comments, like where mm-hmm. she'll just be like "Wow" or "Funny" or "This made me laugh." Or this, but then she gives you this sort of like letter where she'll mm-hmm. say like here's my big picture thoughts. And they're both really helpful ways to do it because it's helpful to know like which lines are hitting and which lines are missing. Mm-hmm. But then like this idea of shaping it was very helpful. And then after that, I asked Amy Fusselman to take a look at it. And she was like, I, I'm not going to give you, and she was like, I can't give you line by line edits. Cause like, I don't have the time, but I'll give you big picture ideas. And the thing about her that was amazing was like, she just read it and she was, she sort of nailed it. It's like, you ever, have you ever written something where someone says like, I love how you were trying to do this. And you're like, I, I wasn't trying to do that consciously, but now I realize that or at least I, I hope I was. That. Yeah. Yeah. Like, but you're like, I hope that's what I was doing. But she was like, she nailed like the essence of the book. She's like, your book is about communication and your book is about how doctors like can sometimes communicate well. And sometimes they don't communicate well. You've weaved in the story of your father, who's this legendary doctor and yet has a stutter. And yet mm-hmm. somehow he's been able to overcome a stutter to be the world's greatest communicator. And so in essence, what you're saying is like being a good doctor is being a good communicator. So it's a book about talking <laughs> like, mm-hmm. wow. And then all of a sudden I was like, yes, that's what it is. Like, because the whole book started from this one exchange I had with a colleague in the hospital where I was just walking through the halls. It was a friend of mine that I'd known for a while, but I hadn't seen her in a while. And I was like, how's it going? And she was like, it's awful, actually. Like I just did a thoracentesis, which is when you put a, a needle in someone's lung to draw a fluid. It's like, I just did a thoracentesis and I got a pneumothorax, meaning that she like punctured the lung. Uh-huh. And she's like, and now I got to go tell the family that he's going to have need to have a chest tube put in. And she was like, so broken down. And then I was like, she's going to go to this family and she's going to be so composed when she goes to the family and she's going to be like completely professional. And she's going to say like, we did this procedure. There was a complication. We're going to do this and everything. You know, she's going to be in this perfectly composed manner because that's the kind of doctor she is. But to me, she was so vulnerable. And I was like, and the patient's family is going to have no idea how vulnerable she is about this mistake she just Uh made. And that was the whole genesis of the book. I was like, I want them to know that we feel this way. Uh And, and it was, so it was like, okay, this is how we talk to each other. And then this is how we talk to the patients. And somehow Amy sort of nailed that. She's like, it's a book about talking. Did that help you write like the query letter and stuff like that? It definitely helped me write that sort of like, yeah, that because I think one of the hardest things is writing that sort of like synopsis of your book, like the jacket copy of your book. And that definitely helped me frame it that the yeah, because I I don't know why that's such a hard process, but Uh because I've had to do that again for my my more recent book. And fortunately, this time they had like a professional write the jacket copy, (laughs) like the version that I wrote was not not very good. So they just had someone completely redo it. And I was like, Oh, my God, like, that's how you do it. So (laughs) whoever these professionals are, they should like give a little like 
YouTube video on how they do it. Cause like when I read the jacket copy, I was like, oh my God, this is so, like, this is so much better than my book. Like this jacket copy is so much better than my actual book. That is so funny. So this doctor book in the series, I'm curious how much editing you did. And then, I mean, I love it. Was it well received? Did you f- ever find out? Was it well received in the series? Well, so in terms of the editing, there's basically were two people who did a lot of the sort of initial rounds of edits, which, so it was Chris Shaberg, who's one of the series editors, and then one of his graduate students, who's like, as part of her graduate work, did edit. So I got two two rounds of like, very good, like substantive edits, like this section needs this work. And, mm-hmm. But there wasn't a lot of comments. And actually, Chris told me, I think this was a compliment. <laughs> he said, of all the object lessons books, yours is my mom's favorite. So I think <laughs> I think that's a I think that's a compliment. So yeah. It's definitely different than the rest in the series. I mean, a lot of them have a big like personal component to it and a big like memoir component, but I think it's interestingly one of the less academic ones because I didn't I didn't feel like I had to go crazy on the research to prove my knowledge of of medicine just because I myself, you know, have that as my as my field. But yeah. But what I like about the series is that every book is so different. Mm-hmm. Um and every book sort of has its own unique form and you know, like I think mine has like more chapters than any other one. Like I think mine has like 18 chapters. Like most object lessons books are like five chapters, six chapters. I have so many of these short chapters. So that's sort of like unique to my style. But in terms of like how it was received or reviewed, I mean, there were, I mean, there's like Amazon comments and Goodreads comments, some of which are really nice and some of which are really negative. But then like, you know, a couple of like literary journals wrote coverage of it. And those, those were generally good. I mean, it, it, these books don't get a lot of coverage. So, you know, two or three literary journals writing about it is about what you mm-hmm. expect. But I think most people thought it was sort of an interesting take on medicine. What was really exciting was, I think the summer after it came out, there's a doctor's book club that did it, that did it as their book club. Oh, and, fun. And then they invited me to join it and they do their book club over Twitter. And so they they just will like post comments and then, but the person who runs the book club wrote like a really nice review of the book for the for the other people in the book club to sort of say, here was my take on the book. And he he, you know, he was saying, you know, like he reads a lot of these doctor memoirs and he thought this one was was different because it was so honest. Like it was so, you know, to basically pull back the curtain and show people the truth. And that's sort of what I was like, that's the best compliment. Just that anyone time time someone says like, this feels really honest or that this feels really genuine. Like that's, that to me is like the best. And I guess that goes back to what that agent was saying is like, no one's going to say like, this was so beautiful. And this was so like interesting Mm -hmm. in form. Like they're going to be like, this was honest. This was genuine. This was such a, you know, different take. So content, not style. Yeah. So your dad, what did your dad say? When what did your wife say? <laughs> they, they, um, they are featured prominently as characters yeah. in this book. My I think my, my dad really liked it. I think he was flattered to be, you know, get the dedication. And my older brother called it like a love letter to my dad. So he, I mean, it's I think it's an overall very flattering book. I mean, I did, I do think I learned a good lesson, which was I think he would have liked to have known beforehand that I'm writing a book about his stutter to some degree without you know, reading it for the first time as a finished copy. So <laughs> that's definitely something I learned, which is show people who are in your text, you know, the material. My wife, I think she felt like I, you know, I, I painted a pretty accurate picture. I, she had much more comments on the parenting book that I wrote than the doctoring book that I wrote. I think I, I think she sort of views herself as less of a character in the in the doctoring book. So mm. I, um, yeah. Okay, so let's let's actually talk about the second book, Long Days, Short Years. Explain the premise. Yeah, so the prem- <laughs> the premise of that book is it is a, a cultural history of modern parenting. So it's basically analyzing what has happened to parenthood over the last 50 years and how specifically parenting has moved away from this sort of like natural role to more of a hard-earned job that you are basically like, feel like you have to work at it and you have to hone your skills and it's basically become like a, a sort vocation of a task. almost yes yeah. exactly but like a task that you're trying to perfect all the time 
and this quest for perfection, you know, my, my, my like look into this is has this quest for perfection really just sort of sapped away all the enjoyment of what it means to be a parent. So I just sort of analyzed like a bunch of different phenomena about modern parenting. And then I, you know, lay through all my own experiences as a parent and all the failures and struggles of my own parenting, you know, mixed in with this. So it's very similar to the doctor book. It's sort of like the parent version of doctor book. In fact, like the first version of the book that I wrote was called parent. <laughs> like, so it's called, because I, I was actually, I was actually called parent and then in parentheses verb. So like, as if you looked up the word parent in a dictionary and you gain the verb form of parent, but I, I thought it was sort of cute. It was like, oh, your first book's called doctor. Your second book's called parent, but that didn't work out. But it was, it was originally an idea to just sort of explore this verb form of parenting in a, in sort of an extended manner. So how did, did that start as a proposal? And this one also, it sounds like went through an evolution too, right? Yeah, a big evolution. So the original version of this book was a straight up fatherhood memoir. So it was basically the story of how I was completely messing up with my kids, especially my middle son, how I would like get these like violent, rage filled, like angry outbursts. At one point it was like close to getting physical and I just had to like take a step back. And then basically I, I relayed how I just became immersed in the parenting literature. And I basically became like a convert to all of the parenting advice. And the arc was that by the end, I sort of said like, well, I can't go all in on this because some of the stuff is crazy, but I'm going to take the salient parts that are relevant to my life. And the biggest part of it was to basically, you need to see your kids for who they are. You need to approach them on their terms, not your terms. And so like when I told you my older brother's a screenwriter, when he read it, he's like, he's like, you literally wrote a love story. You wrote a love story about how you fell in love with your kids. And it's a, so it was like a very traditional sort of memoir with that arc. And my agent actually loved it. He was just like, this is amazing. It's going to be, a, he's like, it's going to be a really hard sell. He's oh, like, really? Because, he yeah. He's that like, for the second like, one too. Yeah. He's like, this is going to be a really hard sell, but I will, I will send it out. So the first one he did, he wouldn't send out, but this one he's like, I will send it out because I, I love this so much. I think you're hitting all the right notes and you're, you're so honest. Like you're not, you're not hiding anything. He's like, but it will be really hard because to be honest, no, he's like, how many fatherhood memoirs have you read? <laughs> like not that many. And he's like, yeah, because you know, he's like, fathers don't read. I mean, like mothers read. So people like, if you wrote a motherhood memoir as a mother, you could probably sell, but it's hard to find a fatherhood memoir. And if you, th- if you think about it, a lot of the fatherhood memoirs are more like humorous, like, Oh, look at me. I don't know how to take care of kids. It's like very, <laughs> you know, there's not a lot of like, really like these types of like heart on your sleeve, you know, but what's the thing you say that like, cut open a vein and bleed, right? So yeah, not, not yeah. a lot of that in the, in, in the fatherhood memoir space. So he sent it out to like, I, I mean, this is going to sound crazy. I think like 20 places and and no nobody took it. And he had like really good relationships with these editors. And not only did they not take it, but they didn't even like it. Because I could tell by these email, you know, so the, I told you when I was a med student, I sent out a novel that didn't get accepted, but every one of those editors wrote back this like full page letter being like, you know, what they liked about the book, what was missing. But a lot of times, like I was so close to taking, you know, like things that really made you think they liked it. These were like to the agent, like, I always love your taste. Please keep sending me, you know, books. This one just didn't work for me. You know, it was like very quick. (laughs) So I was like, this book is not working. And so I said to him, I said, let's, let's do the series route again. Like, do you do, like, what do you think about me trying to send this to a series? And I said, there's this series at MIT called the essential knowledge series. And I, I like that series because it's very much like object lessons or short books. And so I submitted it to them as yeah, I'm going to write a book about the parent form of verb. And I submitted it to their essential knowledge series and the editor really liked it. And it, there they go through a bunch of rev- bunch of rounds of reviews on just your proposal before they will accept the book. So you send them three chapters, a very detailed, like annotated outline, um, like a 12 to 15 page outline. And then your peer, they send out to peer reviewers who make comments on your outline as well as your chapters. And there were three, two loved it, one hated it. And he was like, as long as you can tell me how you'll respond to the one who hated it, I'll be able to, I think I'll be able to get the press to, to take it. 
And that is like right up my wheelhouse because when you write a scientific article, yeah. you get back comments from peer reviewers and you get like 75 comments and you just like have to respond to each comment. So I was like, oh, this is easy. I'll do this. I remember I was in a hotel room in San Diego for a conference and I gave a lecture and then I went upstairs and like in one afternoon, I just cranked out responses to every one of the reviewers comments. And I sent it back and then he was like, yeah, we're going to do it. And actually we're going to do it not as part of the essential knowledge series. We're going to do it as a standalone trade, a hardcover book. Because I, what I didn't know at the time was that MIT was MIT Press was shifting into this whole trade publishing division where they put out books that they're they're trying to get to lay audiences, where they take like academic writers and repackage them for for non academic audiences, and so they had just like done a few of those, and then now they've really ramped it up. So he was like, "Yeah, you're, we're going to do it as a standalone trade a uh, trade hardcover, not not part of a series." So I was like, "Oh my god, like that's that's great!" And then this was all like February 2020. I was, I remember I was in, my family and I were in Portugal on, on vacation and I was like doing the contracts with my agent over, over like email at like super late at night in Portugal. And I was just like, this is great. Like I have all the way till December to write this. I've already written, like I had already written this memoir. I was like, I'm just going to take some of the memoir stuff and throw in some research. It'll be the easiest process. And like, I came back and like within two weeks, it was like COVID and then uh -huh. like everything just like shut down and and that changed like the whole trajectory of the book. And then actually the way I got back into, so I didn't do any writing on the book at all for the, like I told you for that first four months, because mm -hmm. I was not on a train. I was just also like completely consumed by COVID. And I was just like, oh yeah, we were all like, yeah. it was just, just like messy. Yeah. Like, so I, I think there are some people who were like really productive, but it wasn't me. I couldn't even read regular books. I would just listen to old, I would, cause I was driving obviously. So I couldn't really read anyway, but I would just listen to old albums. And every day I would just pick a new album and listen to it on the ride in and on the ride back. And then at night I just did like these zoom, like the guy who did my local pub quiz, he started doing zoom trivia. And so like, I would just do zoom trivia every night. And that was it. Like, I just had this crazy sort of like hermetic life with, with my family. But in June, I was like, I got to get, I got to start writing on this. And the editor that I work with at MIT Press was like, you should put a chapter in about parenting during the pandemic. Like, oh, yeah. and I was like, oh, I was like, yeah, I should. And so I was like, oh, that, that'll be the way I'll start writing about the book is I'll start writing about parenting during the pandemic. So I wrote that chapter, which he wanted to be the introduction. It eventually became the, the epilogue. And I, I basically just started interviewing parents about their parenting during the, the pandemic experience. And I started writing it. And then that sort of got me back into the groove of writing. You know, then I slowly started putting the book and together. And you started after writing the train again. Yeah. But it's funny because like, I remember one of the, after the manuscript was done and I, they sent it again for peer review, someone was like, this parenting during the pandemic chapter just feels so different from the rest of the book. It's like, <laughs> and I was like, I think they, what they recognized was that I, I wasn't writing as well. I needed to get my, need to get my like, reps back in I need to practice uh -huh. more because so then I was like yeah you know what I, now that I read it it's not as smooth and so then I went back and did a lot of like just polishing of that chapter again because I over time I just had become a better writer uh -huh. and it's it's like so much of writing is just the reps and yeah. if you're like especially if you're someone who has a job that's so demanding or just a life that's so demanding and you have so little time to write like for me, I have like 20 minutes a day to write. So it's like, it takes me a long time to build up those 10,000 hours, those 20,000 hours. So, you know, like I just finished a, a, a manuscript just recently and I sent it off to my agent and I was like, I'm not objective about my own writing, but I do feel like I've hit this groove now where I finally know like how to write. And this is like, to me, what I want to write. But it took me like all the way to this moment to really feel like I've hit that stride um, yes, that's that, I, awesome. that actually like I know what I'm doing. Right? Like I, I actually know what the process is because it was interesting. Like when I wrote the doctor book and I wrote the parenting book, I made a big point of like writing the chapters in a way that I could actually try to publish some of them as like standalone essays and mm -hmm. I think it was because I needed to know like that there were some lit journal editors that would be like yeah this is good I'll publish it so like to give me that feedback this latest thing that I wrote I haven't sent it to any places because I was like this is for one it exists as a whole like I, I consider this like one long essay and for two is like I don't want 
I don't want or need the feedback right now. Like I said, it's just some beta readers, you know, people uh-huh. whose comments I really, you know, trust and, and know I'll use, but I didn't need like this external stamp of approval. Like, you know, you're doing this right. Cause I feel like I finally have that practice now in me to do it. I love that. Yes. So you said like you did some stuff on planes and to finish this latest manuscript, are you like stealing away ever and able to like get in a good weekend or anything, or you're just literally (laughs) doing 20 minutes a day? I'm still, I, so I would say this one, everything was written in that 20 minutes a day, except the last chapter. I happened to be away for a weekend for work and I was in a hotel and I, and it was like, I've only since COVID, I think my life before COVID, I did so much traveling. I I mean, maybe not compared to other jobs, but for a, for a doctor, like I would travel like two or three times a month sometimes. So I would be in a hotel. So I, but I hadn't been in a hotel by myself since COVID in like so long. So I happened to be also in an area where there wasn't a lot to do. And it was like a Saturday morning and I sat for like three or four hours and I wrote straight and I, and I actually like basically wrote the, what was like the last half of the last chapter, which is something like 2000 words or something. Nice. Um, and I just like cranked it out in this like sort of like frenzy. I remember just being like, Oh my God, like, it's like, you don't have to stop. Like you can keep mm-hmm. going. And I remember at one point I was like, I should eat something. And I was like, no, nah, you don't really need to eat. Like you have, <laughs> you have no responsibility now. Like, you know, you can just, you can have lunch at two, you can have lunch at three, or you can just skip lunch. I remember at one point I was like, just fucking eat candy. Like you can, you can have candy and then go right to dinner. Right. And so it's like, and I remember it was just like this completely free feeling. And, and it's funny. Cause now when I reread that section, it, it has this like flow to it that, um. I mean, I think only probably like only like like you know your own stuff this way Mm -hmm. but it's just like I can feel it sort of just like coming out in a way that it doesn't feel as forced sometimes when I read some of my like what compared to some of the other stuff that I read oh yeah and that feels so good too just in your body so I'm curious for the research that you had to do it sounds like you were you know doing the research because of this situation with your son anyway but how did you approach researching the parenting book and like, did it change you as a parent? It definitely changed me as a parent. And actually for this most recent thing I, I'm I'm working on, I did a lot of research for that too. And that also changed me a lot. And for the doctor book, I would do a little bit of research and it def- that definitely improved my doctoring. I feel like that's part of the reason why I wanted to write about parenting. Cause like, I was like, I'm doing all this research. And I think if I start writing about it, I'm going to be a better parent because this is how I process it, right? Like I actually have to like put it down into coherent thought. And yeah, so like what I do, I'm not sure this is how anybody else would function, but what I do is when I'm reading a book that I know is sort of research for what I'm writing, I'll just, I'll take pictures of the pages yeah, and then like, I'll pick like one day or two days where I'll just, the only thing I do is transcribe those pictures onto a word document. So I'll just say like, from this book and I'll just write, mm-hmm. I'll write the quote out and then, from, and then from this book, write the quote out. And so I'll have like a 20 page document of quotes and then I'll start inserting those quotes into my text. And then once I insert the quote, I, I like basically like highlight the text on my quote thing and just do that strike through. So I know mm-hmm. that I've used it and I just keep working my way until I've used all the quotes. Cause I, fr- I, I figure like if, if it was meaningful enough that I pull my phone out to take a picture of it, I should use it. Yeah. And and I pretty much use like, I would say like 95% of those pictures. That's a really good system. So and I think what- the idea of transcribing it really makes you process it again. Cause yes. you're like, okay, like this is really like what, there's a reason why I took a picture of this. Sometimes I'll look at it like, why did I take a picture of that? Um, <laughs> but for the most part, it's like, yeah, it's like, okay, now that's why I took a picture of that. So like in the promoting process, you know, you're saying like, you kept your expectations low enough because of how these books typically operate. But like, did you have any big wins PR wise on these books? And what would you do differently? Would you hire PR like on your next book or? Well, for the, for the doctor book, I use the in-house publicist. So the, the publicist, the publicist at the publisher who does like a ton of books. So I I didn't, I mean, I think she had like 
probably like 50 books to publicize at the same time. So she basically was like, I'm sending your books out to these places. And she gave me like a spreadsheet of like 50 places she sent it to. If there's any other places you want me to send it to, please let me know. And I'll let you know if any of them want to, you know, interview you or, but you know, anything else you would set up on your own. So like book readings, I set up on my own and any sort of uh, interviews, like podcast interviews, I would set up on my own. For the parenting book, the publisher hired a freelance publicist. So she's not affiliated with the press. She runs her own PR for, for authors and they hired her for me. So I didn't have to pay for her, which was nice. Cause I, I don't know. I can't imagine what she charges, but she was like, I mean, she got me so many interviews of, of varying levels of like, you know, audience. So like, right. I thought my, it's like tonight, my daughter was asking me, she's like, what's the biggest like interview you've ever done because I was telling her I'm going downstairs to do a podcast and I was like well actually I did BBC Radio 4 which was like hey. huge like you know like that yeah. was so exciting and then I said and I did Dallas NPR which was also like a huge market because like my friend who lives in Dallas was like well I heard you on the dead PR you know it's like so exciting <laughs> and I did like a couple of like relatively big market NPRs but then I also did like I did like some podcast where like I was like I'm not even sure like how many people it, are listening? How many this? people are listening to this? Because like <laughs> these are like really small, but they all were like really interesting conversations. It's always like so flattering because you know these folks have read your book and they have questions yeah. like that are like really like geared towards it. My book on Amazon, it, like it has like different categories, and there's one category that's like a really like esoteric category. I forget what it's called, but like. Basically, like if you sell like one book, your ranking moves a lot. Oh. So I can always tell after a podcast airs or after like I do a radio interview, if people actually bought the book. So like when I did that, the, I did this like serious XM show and like all of a sudden I went from like 1000 to 50, you know, but again, like it's not 50 of all the books on Amazon, but 50 within this really niche category. So I was like, Oh, 1,000 to 50. That's probably like seven or eight books that sold just from that yeah. series. So, so it's like, that's sort of like a an interesting way to look at how you're doing just based on like, if your book is in a weird Amazon category, you can see it like pretty clearly shift. And then, you know, then another like one will play and it doesn't move at all. So you're like, okay, nobody bought the book based on that. <laughs> so do you think, I mean, I'm current, you know, I've got a proposal that I'm working on sending out and I'm working in Chloe's class on another memoir and essays, but I think in my head, like it would just be so important to me that even if it was like, <laughs> you know, I'm negative money on this thing, I would still probably want to hire PR. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the next book I, if I'm lucky enough to have another book, I would want that same publicity experience too, because it did feel really great to just have these conversations. Like I'm, I'm having a blast right now. Like it's, like, it's so yeah. fun to, especially like if you're not a part of a big writing community, like I'm not part of, like, I don't really get to talk to other writers unless I'm doing something like this. Like I've done like a few of these writer podcasts and they're like the best things. I, I told one of them, I was like, this is like the treat that I told myself. I said at one point about a month before the book came out, I was like, this might've been a huge mistake. <laughs> to like publish this book you're not a parenting expert people are going to be like who the hell is this guy telling us how to parent like you're opening yourself up to just getting like massacred and I, I mean I put something in the introduction to be like a disclaimer like I'm a very like unorthodox messenger here and I, I also realize like I have a huge amount of privilege coming to this space right but I was like I'm going to still get killed. But I remember saying like, well, at least you get to do one of these writer podcasts because you've always wanted to just talk about writing. So like, yeah, it's like, it's so fun to talk about your book and it's so fun to talk about what you write. And like, you know, I heard this writer who's like a pretty good writer. I, I, I won't say who it is, but she was talking on a podcast and she was like, yeah, I check Goodreads all the time. And I read all the comments that people write about my books, even if they write like really nasty comments or really good comments. Like, I don't care. I'm just like, thank you for like engaging with my book. Like, I'm so <laughs> happy that you, she's like, and I check it all the time to like reinforce that people are engaging with my book for positive or negative. And I was like, oh, I was like, I'm glad she like admitted to that. Cause like, I, I, you know, I think that's sort of, it's sort of, you're right. Like you write something, you want it to be, you know, like that's the whole thing about like that Winnicott quote, like everybody's yearning to be seen, right? Like mm -hmm. you just, you want to be seen by, by people when you write. Yeah. 
Totally. So what's next for you? You've, you've teased it a little bit, but if you can say anything else and then what's your, do you have any bucket list writing goals aside from your like retirement dream? (laughs) (laughs) So, yeah, so I just finished uh, like a book length essay and we'll see, we'll see how that pans out. It's sort of hard to describe, which may not be a very good harbinger (laughs) for its prospects, but it, it, it essentially is a book length essay about the concept of adherence, like how we adhere to, to to things that are important. And I sort of approach that through the lenses of, of both medicine and parenting. So like, how do we do things even when they're hard, right? Mm. So, and I think, I think I, I'm trying to remember if I heard this on your podcast, but I remember somebody saying that like, after you finish a book, you realize what that book was missing and that's how you write your next book did i hear that on oh on your i think podcast? matt bell did say that yeah okay, something yeah. like that right so it's like after i finished the parenting book i realized when i was doing all these like interviews about the book that people were asking me for some sort of advice and were asking me like you know they were really they really weren't that interested in like the research i had done about like how moms are older now or how like fathers are doing more than more share of the housework or how, you know, free range parenting is a position of privilege. You know, they, they really were like, how do you get kids to, to behave when they're Shut active? the fuck up without yeah, spanking right. them. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right. Tips. Yeah. So I was like, they're, they're, that was a big missing component. So I was like, well, how would I approach trying to, to give advice? Well, so, so it's not an advice book at all. It's really just an exploration of in my life, it, as a doctor and as a parent, like, what am I seeing that works and doesn't work in terms of adhering? But then I, I get into a lot of other things like addiction and recovery and COVID and science denial. And it's sort of like, I mean, what I really was wanted to do was give myself a chance to write one of those like book length essays where you're just like, I'm going to go, on, I'm going to take a path of where this author's mind's going and let's see where it goes. So hopefully that works out. But now that I've, uh, but the bucket list, like I'll never give up the dream of that. I would love to write a novel. Like I, I, I still would love to do that. And maybe if I had like a lot of time to do it, to write where I had more than 20 minutes a day, I might be, cause I think you really need to invest your whole immerse like yourself. Yeah. You really do need to immerse yourself to do that. That's right. But that's sort of like a bucket list. And I, I remember after I finished, after I finished this draft, I was joking to somebody. I was like, I think now I'd like, I need to give like myself a break and like, maybe it'll be fun to write a little bit of fiction just to like not feel like I have to be beholden to the truth all the time. But that's definitely my bucket. Like if you told me like you won the lottery, you don't have to worry about anything. You can just live off of your lottery winnings. Like I would just try to become a novelist. I would. I love that. Amazing. What's one piece of writing advice you wish you could give your former self? Probably slow down and not worry about like the pace of your writing and the pace of your writing achievements. And like, you don't need to feel like you, like if you haven't published a book by age 25 or 30, you failed, you know, like don't compare yourself to other people really just, just enjoy, enjoy what writing can do for you. Like, I think like I've finally have reached that point where I realized that, that writing for me is a real like therapeutic process. Like in to some degree, like I don't feel like I'm being productive about like my own thoughts if I'm not doing like daily writing. So like, I'm actually in a writing break right now. Cause I was just like, okay, I'm going to wait to hear back comments on this and I'll just read every day. And so I'm reading on the train in the morning. I'm getting so much reading that it's crazy. Like, it's like, it's so nice to just be like, I'm going to read. But at the same time, I'm like, in my back of my head, I'm like, that, like my hands feel idle, right? Like I should be writing something. And so I'm just like throwing around like these like memories that I should be writing about. Like, uh, you know, just so I think what I would say to like the younger me is like, just cherish writing for what it is. Like uh-huh. that whole idea that I gave up like writing for four or five years, like that, that probably coincided with a really unhappy period of my life. And that, that's probably not coincidental. Yeah. I love that you're getting itchy again yeah. <laughs> for your writing. <laughs> What's one tip for writers trying to get a book published? I So I listened to your episode with Matt Bell and he was, I think when you, I think, at, I think to this exact question, he was like, 
He's like, you, it's very easy to get a book published. And I was like, and I listened, I was like, maybe for you. But I know, maybe like, for like, you. Right, because totally. you're like an amazing <laughs> writer. Like, I, I, I do think the biggest advice I would say is like, be strategic. And I do think getting an agent, obviously, is a huge part of it, especially if you're trying to publish at a relatively, you know, bigger, bigger press. And I've had success twice by following like strategy. So when I was in medical school, I somebody told me find the youngest agent at a good at a good agency. Like find the person mm-hmm. that just got moved up from assistant to to actually being able to have his or her own clients. And so I I did that and that worked. So I think that strategy is probably still a good strategy. And then the other strategy that I had heard, which worked the second time, which is basically query the agents of the authors you like. Um, now that may not work if like, if you like like these super duper bestsellers, because those like that. So that might only work for like the kind of nonfiction that I like. But I do think it's helpful when you're writing to an agent to say like, I'm writing you because you represent, like that was the first sentence of my query letter. Like I'm writing you because you represent X, Y, and Z who are three of my favorite authors and whose books have literally inspired what I'm sending you. Because I think like, if you're an agent that you're like, it's probably like, wow, yeah, like, okay, this person knows who I am uh-huh. and they like my, they like my taste. And I, I th- you know, in the very least, they'd be interested to read it, right? They may not like love what you've written, but at least they'll get, you, they'll, they'll read your stuff. So I think that those are the two pieces of advice I would say is, and I, but I don't think those are unique pieces of advice. I think that's probably what, what a lot of people say. Yeah, no, I think those are good ones. Um, oh, but I, I, the one thing I'll add is if you, for, this is particularly for creative nonfiction. My lesson being that series are a good place to to publish weird books. <laughs> so if you have a weird book, see if there's a series that it might fit in. If if you're not having any like success sort of as, as a standalone. Yeah, hot tip. What's your all-time favorite piece of your own writing? I would say... We I, we talked about this a little bit earlier. Like sometimes you write something and you don't realize what you're writing and you don't realize like the meaning of it. And my friend's father, who I think is a great reader, like he reads so much. When he finished my book about doctors, he wrote me this beautiful email about the last chapter and about this closing scene where I'm watching my my daughter basically pretend to be a doctor with her doll, but she's basically aping her grandfather. Uh-huh. And at the end my father, her grandfather had just told me not to worry about my son's rash. So he kept on saying, don't worry, don't worry. And then, so he said, I couldn't believe that you ended with like the words, don't worry, because like she was copying your dad, but she was also telling you, don't worry about, don't worry about your dad. Don't worry about the state of medicine. Don't worry about yourself. Mm -hmm. Like she was, it was, and I remember I was like, shit, I didn't, I don't think I did that on purpose, but maybe I maybe I did it subconsciously. But now every time I read that last section, I get that like goosebump feeling because uh-huh. I'm like, and I think he helped me sort of realize like what I was doing. And that happens a lot with things I write. I, I, I would wonder if other people do where you, I'll read something that I wrote and I'm just like, it almost feels like somebody else wrote it. Like, like yeah. how did I get lucky enough to to get that right or how did Who's I get lucky genius? enough to- well, yeah, but not, not that, but it's more just like, how did I, like, how did I get to that point? Yeah. Like, I wish I could recapture it. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, totally. And sometimes I feel like, like a reference that I, that I pull in, I'm like, man, that's so lucky. I found that reference. Like, it, like it, 10 things had to happen for me to have found this reference and it's the perfect reference. So there's so much luck also involved, I think in, in writing. Well, I really, there's like so much more I wanted to talk to you about. I even wanted to talk to you about, (laughs) I think you should write, this is a whole nother podcast, but I'm obsessed with longevity right now. So I'm obsessed with those types of conversations. You know, when I was, uh, when I was a med student, I did, my, my research was on the anti-aging movement. Was it? Yeah, it was, but I worked with an, it was an ethicist doing research. I wonder if you've read his book, if you're into this, if you're into this thing, but he, he wrote a pretty big book about it. He and his wife, they co-authored it. And I was his like research assistant for the book. Fascinating. Yeah. I'm yeah. obsessed with like David Sinclair and, you know, Peter Atia and all those guys. I'm like trying to live to 103 over here. 
<laughs> well, the one thing that I so the the one thing that I learned from that all that research was the the most tried and true way to live long is calorie restriction. Mm -hmm. Like Okinawa, for example, like mm -hmm. people in Okinawa, they eat like twelve. At least when I was doing this research, they would eat like on average like twelve hundred calories a day, and they live to like nineties and hundreds on average. And if you if you calorically restrict animals, like in a lab, they all live long. So that's like a very, but it's like, who wants to live a, like, you think of like, what I, do I want to live a long life of caloric restriction? Like that, that would be awful. Right? That's what we're doing to our, our dog right now. Like, <laughs> calorically oh. I see it in the background. It's like, where's my food? <laughs> like we're, we are, we are preserving your life for long, long, long. <laughs> well, thank you so much. This was awesome. Where can listeners connect with you online? I'm on Twitter at A.S. Bombeck. I, I have to warn your listeners, it's like 50% of it is nephrology tweets. <laughs> and, Hope you uh, like kidneys. 50% and 50% are about, you know, things that I write. I actually don't tweet that much, though. I, I mostly just tweet to promote conferences or articles or if, I, if I'm on a podcast or interview. I, but I, original content, I don't really... I, I don't really do that well. Every once in a while, I'll put something out there. I'm like, oh, this is funny. And then nobody responds. So I stopped doing that. <laughs> and then on Instagram, I am at Andrew Bombeck, uh, all one word. I, I believe I'm on Facebook. I don't know what my Facebook name is. You know, I'd love to interact with people in any of those platforms. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you, Courtney. This was an awesome conversation.